population of a cannabis compound, say THC, because it has the most documented negative side effects, where you actually won't experience any therapeutic properties. What's happening from a kind of like brain chemistry standpoint is that your receptors have just been so overwhelmed. Those CB1 receptors in your brain that THC is binding to have been so overwhelmed that you can think of them as they're just kind of broken. They're tired mm. and broken, and they don't really want to send out many more signals. And so the good news is, is that you can conduct a tolerance reset if you are smoking flour, let's say, it it really only takes about at minimum 48 hours to reset most of your tolerance. And you can still use CBD, which is good. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are using concentrates and exposing your brain to really high concentrations of THC, it'll probably be more around two to three weeks of a full tolerance reset to kind of get you back to baseline. But the body is really flexible and really forgiving when we go look to to reset tolerance. For some people, though, who, who are needing to be exposed to high concentrations of cannabinoids um, for medical reasons, that's, that's a hard thing to do. And right. therefore, we have to look to our other compounds in cannabis, CBD especially, to kind of help to offset that issue. So we know that the THC um, induces a high feeling and that the CBD doesn't have any intoxication, but both of them are considered medicinal in their own right. Can you tell us a little bit about what each one is more useful for and how they work together? Sure. Yeah. So just as you said, both of them have quite a range of therapeutic properties. THC has been identified to have 20 times the anti-inflammatory power of an aspirin. So it's really amazing at anti-inflammatory action. It also is a really potent pain reliever. And so for people who are experiencing neuropathic pain and muscle pain and really many types of pain, THC is more useful in your medicine cabinet than CBD. However, they both work really, really well together. Mm -hmm. CBD on its own has a slew of properties, mostly in the realm, again, of that uh, homeostatic efficacy. So it helps to bring the body back into balance. It interacts with our immune system. It helps to speed up recovery of different kinds of wound healing, just generally helps to keep keep us at a good level from mood to physicality to whatever it may be. However, on its own, it cannot really effectively engage our endocannabinoid receptor system. Now, it needs THC in order to engage with the endocannabinoid receptor system, and this is how it works. So THC binds to our CB1 receptors in the brain, and it initiates for not only the intoxicating experience, but also that pain relief, that anti-inflammatory action. THC is also really helpful in the reduction of tumor size and regulating cell growth, which is really impactful for people who are experiencing cancer. However, it also comes along with a slew of uncomfortable side effects if dose gets too high. So you Mm -hmm. can have the anxiety and the elevated heart rate and the paranoia, um, with CBD. So now when THC is bound to the CB1 receptor and THC has to be bound to that receptor, CBD can actually come and bind to a secondary binding site on that same receptor. And Mm -hmm. so only when THC is bound, does it open up this secondary binding site for CBD to come in and bind. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you increase the therapeutic value of the cannabinoids. Um, It's this synergistic relationship where you're increasing your anti-inflammatory efficacy, you're increasing your pain relieving potential, you're increasing your anti-cancer potential, and you're diminishing the negative side effects that come along with THC. So you're actually reducing the anxiety, reducing the paranoia, and reducing the elevated heart rate. And so really, THC and CBD are, yes, they are powerhouses on their own, but together, they really have quite a dramatic effect. Wow, that is incredible. I know. That's so cool. (laughs) I'm nerding out a little bit. (laughs) Tell me the difference 
well, no. Tell me why you don't think that there should be a difference between sativa and indica. These are the two labels mm. that a lot of people, especially bud tenders, have given me. Would you like indica, sativa, or hybrid? And when you go to look at the menus, that's usually how they're listed as well. So what are your thoughts about those labels? Mm. I think that this is the most important philosophy that anybody working in the cannabis industry should understand. So indica and sativa, they are species of cannabis. And even some experts may argue the fact that they're not. But for the purposes of this conversation, indica and sativa are identified species of the cannabis genus. And in 1753, the father of modern taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus, he saw a cannabis sativa plant. He saw it grow tall and lanky with its narrow leaves, its loose female flowers, and he identified it as sativa. So he identified that species and noted all of the morphological characteristics or the way in which the plant was growing. Now, about 30 years later in 1785, another taxonomist by the name of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, he was traveling and he was in India and he saw a cannabis plant growing, but he noted that it had a short stature and really a bushy morphology with dense female flowers and broad leaves. And he said, you know what? There are enough physical distinctions between this plant and the sativa plant that Linnaeus identified that I'm going to create a new species. And mm -hmm. because I am in India, I'm going to call it indica. Ah. And when I teach this subject, I often tell students that at no point is there any kind of record of Linnaeus or Lamarck like rolling up a joint of sativa or indica and making note in their books like, oh my God, I'm so energized. Or, oh my <laughs> God, I'm so sleepy. And I mean, with that line of thinking, then it becomes nonsensical to attribute a, a definition of consistent experience to a plant's morphology, to right. the way that a plant grows. We're, when we consume cannabis, we're not consuming the way that the plant grows. Instead, we're consuming the actual chemical compounds that are in the matrix. And therefore, if we want to better predict experience for ourselves and patients and consumers, then we have to look to those compounds in the matrix. We don't need to look to the species distinction in order to give us an idea of the experience. And furthermore, I mean, most everything on the current legal market is a product of hybridized genetics. Mm. Yes, of course, there are some land races out there, which are kind of pure indica genetics, pure sativa genetics, but most of what you get, if you are purchasing a grape ape on the legal market, let's say, it is not a pure indica. It is a hybridization of indica and sativa genetics. So even if at one point indica did correlate to a sleepier experience and sativa did correlate to a more energizing experience, we can't really use that to determine the experience that a consumer might have. It's, it's ultimately a disservice to the person purchasing cannabis. And really what I recommend to look towards is the chemotype or those chemical compounds, the cannabinoids and the terpenes that we are actually consuming that are actually interacting with our body in order to determine the experience we'll have. Do you think that there could be better training for bud tenders across the US? It seems like very different information coming from different states right now. Oh, yes, yes, <laughs> I do. Since I entered the industry in 2015 as a bud tender, that was the first thing that I took note of. of oh my God, there is no kind of standardized education and training for this group of professionals that are often tasked with answering questions that doctors can't even answer. Right. And thereby creating this kind of disservice to patients because they're often giving them answers that, I mean, by by no means of their own are, are incorrect um, and and like misleading. And then also it's a liability for the business. And it's not good for business if you have a, a group of customers who are coming in and getting answers to, to questions and, and predicted experience that are not really lining up with what yeah. is actually happening and can actually lead to a, a negative experience. And so that's something that... Um, I, I kind of did for myself and, and ended up carving out quite a zone in the space of education for the industry, especially for the bed tender professionals. I mean, there's quite a specific need for training and education on the fundamental elements of cannabis science and cannabis and its purported effects. 
we need a little more research before we can do too much training though, right? I think that we have enough to at least get the fundamentals. We have enough to at least begin to teach people to look beyond indica sativa, to look to cannabinoids and terpenes, to look at the scientific evidence in regards to the therapeutic properties of these compounds, to be able to talk to people about the way that they might work for your body. I mean, in setting up our online training program that uh, we created, We definitely compiled and read tons and tons of white papers and articles to make sure that everything was rooted in scientific evidence and that we at least can get the foundation of what we need to understand to have more intelligent conversations with our patients and customers. Cool. I'm excited to see what what kind of curriculum you guys develop and hopefully that can spread and start to educate all of us. I think it's really important that as consumers and uh, for those of us in the business as well, that we really understand the the most up-to-date science that we can. So thank you for helping to educate us. That was incredibly interesting. Oh, yes. Thank you. My pleasure. And now for your latest cannabis news. You've probably heard of Mass Can Normal, the cannabis advocacy group that holds the Freedom Rally on the Boston Common every year. Well, last week, the board held an emergency meeting, and after a unanimous vote, chairman of the board, Samson Ratiopi, resigned. The meeting was called specifically to discuss his other leading role in a right-wing group called Super Happy Fun America, which is actually best known for its 2019 Straight Pride Parade in Boston, and for more recently holding pro-police rallies during the national outcry for police reform. Even though he resigned, Normal published a statement saying it was going to revoke the group's charter over its willingness to give shelter to bigotry. Its signature gathering season and activists in Washington, D.C. have gathered 35,000 signatures so far to put the decriminalization of psychedelics on the ballot in November. If Initiative 81 is approved by voters, it would make enforcement of laws against plant and fungus-based psychedelics among the lowest law enforcement priorities in D.C. A new study on cannabis has researchers interested in how CBD might reduce the lung inflammation caused by the coronavirus. According to Forbes, researchers from the University of Nebraska and the Texas Biomedical Research Institute wrote about it in a peer-reviewed article in this month's issue of the journal Brain, Behavior and Immunity. Just like Emma told us, CBD has anti-inflammatory properties, and studies have shown that CBD can also increase the production of a type of signaling protein that activates immune cells and prevents viruses from replicating inside the human body. You can find out more about Different Leaf the magazine at differentleaf.com. You can find us on social media at Different Leaf. I'm on social media at Brit the British. Thanks to our awesome producer, Andrea Maraskin, and thanks to Homebody for the music.